Hi, I'm Steve Selling, founder of Fit Test. In part two of my series on silent myocardial ischemia and silent myocardial infarction for exercise professionals, the topic of this video is on diabetes and silent ischemia. So just uh, the, um, some of the cellular mechanisms that are responsible for the close correlation or close connection between diabetes and atherosclerosis or myocardial ischemia in general. Uh, first of all, endothelial dysfunction. I'm not going to go through this complex slide in detail because this video is not about cellular biology, but just in brief. Endothelial dysfunction with greater production of vasoconstrictors such as endothelin, angiotensin II, and then pro-thrombogenic uh, drugs such as uh, thromboxane with less production of important endothelial-derived vasodilators uh, such as nitric oxide and uh, anti-clotting agents such as prostacycline. So endothelial dysfunction also has correlations through to atherosclerosis itself. Uh, so these can be intermediate uh, triggers for um, coronary artery disease. Uh, the diabetes causes inflammation of, of blood vessels. I'm not going to go over these in details, in detail, but some of the pro-inflammatory markers are things like uh, tissue necrosis factor, some of the interleukins and C-reactive protein. And then finally, fibrosis and remodeling, which is uh, probably familiar to you in the atherosclerotic uh, process. And combined of all these three, endothelial damage and dysfunction, uh, chronic uh, inflammation and fibrosis and remodeling are all proatherogenic, uh, leading to myocardial ischemia. Now, silent myocardial ischemia, just to revise what I had in part one of this small series, is when myocardial ischemia occurs in the absence of adverse symptoms. So first of all, the epidemiology of the links between diabetes and silent myocardial ischemia. Uh, individuals with diabetes are overrepresented in studies of patients with myocardial ischemia. So diabetes carries with it a, a, a very strong links to myocardial ischemia. And a cardiologist once said to me that patients sitting in a diabetes outpatient clinic a large percent of the percentage of them have coronary artery disease and patients lying in a coronary care unit, a large percentage of those patients have hyperglycemia, glucose intolerance or diabetes. And this, that's never left me after that cardiologist uh, expressed that view. Individuals with diabetes are overrepresented in cohorts of patients with silent myocardial ischemia so the evidence is that um, people with diabetes have about two-fold to seven-fold more incidence of silent myocardial ischemia uh, compared to the people who don't have diabetes. And the interesting um, thing is with uh, coronary artery disease is that the evidence around um, uh, cor the coronary lesions themselves is that they're more extensive involving both microvascular and particularly microvascular disease in people with diabetes. 20 to 50% of asymptomatic patients with diabetes have silent myocardial ischemia. So this is just tying in the concepts I've already spoken about. And coronary artery disease is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in individuals with diabetes. Obviously, peripheral arterial disease is a leading cause of morbidity as well. Diabetes and silent myocardial ischemia uh, carry with it, as I just said, higher rates of morbidity and mortality compared to people with diabetes who are symptomatic in terms of myocardial ischemia, e.g. developed chest pain. Now, this slide here, I'm going to refer uh, all of these points to the excellent review by Cosson and colleagues. Although that review is, is 15 years old now, 
there, there are many uh, points in that review that I think will be of interest to you and are certainly relevant to us as exercise professionals. Now, the first thing is when someone has silent myocardial ischemia, that means myocardial ischemia without the advantage of uh, developing chest pain, which will then point everyone towards identifying and treating early treatment of that ischemia. The patients with silent myocardial ischemia are one, difficult to detect or identify and diagnose, and two, difficult to manage. Now, um, just going through some of the detection identification methods which are in the literature, um, the first are the, the scans in response to, for, for example, exercise stressors, but it could be pharmacological stress as well, but I'm going to focus on exercise stress. So the first of these is inducible or reversible myocardial perfusion uh, defects. That is where someone is put under exercise stress and a radionuclide tracer is then injected into the coronary arteries. I'm not going to go over the method here. And in so doing, that will light up well-perfused regions of myocardium and leave shadows over poorly perfused, in other words, ischemic regions of the heart. And that will be reversible in the, for, in the case of silent uh, ischemia. It's also reversible when people have chest pain uh, related ischemia as well. But I'm just making the point that the perfusion scan then adds some power to the diagnostic uh, tools. Similar to that, uh, regional wall motion abnormalities in say stress test echoes that are reversible. In other words, return uh, reverse with rest or with um, anti-anginals. So that again, in relation to exercise stress, uh, regional wall motion uh, abnormalities will appear in the absence of chest pain. Now, microangiopathic impairments, examples are the kidneys. This is the main one, diabetic nephropathies, uh, and the main one there being uh, increase in microalbuminuria, in other words, urinary album, albumin excretion increases in uh, patients with this um, um, kidney damage. And uh, in the retina, there are diabetic retinopathies, which are rel uh, very non-invasive. So both of these tests are very non-invasive to potentially uh, point towards an individual with silent myocardial ischemia. Macroangiopathic impairments, the examples are in increases in intermediate thickness of carotids, and the calcium artery scores uh, go up. So all of these can point, not necessarily pathognomonic in terms of one-to-one uh, -one find it and that diagnoses silent myocardial ischemia, but at least will help in the diagnosis. Uh, cardiac autonomic nef uh, neuropathy. Now this will be of interest to some of the people watching this video because it's a non-invasive and quite a simple technique to do. Uh, is to look for decreases in heart rate variability in your clients with diabetes, and this may well point towards silent myocardial ischemia. The evidence is that there's much more impairment of heart rate variability in patients with diabetes and silent myocardial ischemia. Decre impaired endothelium dependent vasodilatation increases in B-type type, uh, natriuretic uh, peptide, BMP. This increases acutely with acute damage to the heart in relation to a myocardial infarction, but also increases chronically in relation to heart failure. So again, this uh, can point towards acute and chronic challenges to the heart. Now, the, this, this point here, although... Um, uh, silent myocardial ischemia is strongly associated with these very traditional risk factors of smoking, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension and poor glycemic control. These are so generalised to practically every cardiovascular condition you can think of that it's really not of much help to identify on its own silent myocardial ischemia. But I'll come to risk factor management in the next slide. Uh, if someone has already had a previous and extensive myocardial infarction without, say, developing symptoms, chest pain, then path cues, pathological cues on a resting ECG can be a very simple, non-stressful 
non-invasive method of, a, of pointing towards a previous silent MI. Now, of course, this is after the event and this is not our best tool because the myocardial infarction's already happened. The crucial question then is the long-term management of individuals with diabetes and silent myocardial ischemia. And that's what we're going to get onto here. So medical and dietary interventions for individuals with silent myocardial ischemia include aggressive attention to risk factors for people with diabetes to try and uh, reduce the amount of silent myocardial ischemia. And there is evidence for aggressive um, intervention on risk factors, actually improving the silent myocardial ischemia picture for people with diabetes. Now I come to exercise for, for us as exercise professionals. I'll just say what I do and there's no real right and wrong here. Obviously we're not doing all of these diagnostic techniques that might identify or point um, a, one of our clients towards the high probability of silent myocardial ischemia. So what I do simply is every single one of my clients with diabetes, I, I take the, no, I, I, I guess I just work off the null hypothesis based on what my discussion with a cardiologist a long while ago, that if they have diabetes, it is likely that they have coronary artery disease of some kind. And for that matter, peripheral arterial disease as well, but I'm focusing on the heart here. So my null hypothesis is that a client with diabetes, especially with diabetes of long uh, standing, um, uh, that we would assume that there's some myocardial ischemia or at least some coronary artery disease that could be hopefully subclinical, but we need to just be aware of it. So I think awareness is, it carries you a long way. Uh, now, what exercise can do, and we should be exercising these clients, is it, there's lots of evidence to say it can help coronary vascularization, especially aerobic exercise. There are microvascular benefits in both uh, angiogenesis, producing more collaterals. To some extent, this feeds into larger vessels as well, but it's mainly around the smaller vessels, which will help the client at rest, but not so much will help, help them also in submaximal exercise, but will not help them at maximal exercise because these collaterals are simply don't have enough uh, conduit, enough blood flow conduit available to them to really make a difference in terms of coronary artery blood flow at maximal intensities or very high intensities of exercise. So these microvascular benefits are real, but they really help the, the, the client more at rest and at sub maximal levels of exercise. So really, again, this is not gonna protect your client against high intensity training. Macrovascular benefits um, will, uh, now this has to be large volumes at reasonable intensities of exercise over many years usually, that will improve epicardial coronary artery lumen size. These will be in the sort of people who have exercised for many years, probably their whole adult life before they develop diabetes or while they were developing diabetes. And these will be somewhat protected. So your clients who have had a lifetime or long exposure to aerobic exercise are probably going to do well here. So these are the references that I you know, use to put this small presentation together. And thank you for watching this small presentation on diabetes and silent myocardial ischemia. Bye for now.